Hi, I'm Kim Edelston with FamilyBusiness.org, and today I'm with Diana Clark, who is Chief of Clinical Operations at O'Connor Professional Group, a company well known for their behavioral health programs and their family-based approach towards fostering mental health and recovery. Today, we're going to be talking about a very sensitive topic, problems children of affluent families often struggle with, such as maturity, dependence, and substance abuse problems. Thank you for being with me today, Diana. You're welcome. And I'm excited to have this conversation with you, Kim. Thank you. So why do so many business-owning families have troubled youth? Well, let me start with a bigger umbrella for a minute. We have troubled youth all over our country. Mental health issues, substance use disorders, eating disorders, in fact, are equal opportunity tragedies. When somebody has affluence, the issue tends to go on a little longer than for somebody of lower socioeconomic means because there is more resources to shield the individual from reckoning with a disorder. That's the theory. The other theory is there's less accountability. They, If they work in family business, family members might let behavior slide that a different company wouldn't let slide. And they may be actually engaged in family business roles when that wasn't what their passion was. And so they're dialing it in out of expectation and they're numbing that issue for themselves. So with these problems... How can you tell if it's a stage, say a late bloomer, or you called it the lying stage, versus a real problem that needs attention? I start with the basics. Are they eating? Are they sleeping? Are they engaging in the function that they normally do, i.e. go to school, come to work, or even volunteer? I don't care what it is. Are they able to make eye contact? Are they having conversations? So those kinds of things I start with. If the answer is no to those, and it's been going on more than a couple of weeks, they need professional care. What we often get the question of is, is this experimentation with substances or is this a substance use disorder? And I think I would back it up earlier and say, that the expectation that there be experimentation before the age of 21 is a dangerous proposition. Because what we know is that for kids who delay experimentation with alcohol or any other substances until the age of 21, have a 9% chance of having a problem later. Whereas kids who start at 14, the statistics go up to 57%. And what about um, in family businesses, we often see them, um, I think you called it at a conference, um, failure to launch. So how do you know, again, if it's immaturity or they haven't found their passion or, you know, we, we, we need to actually get help? One, is the individual miserable? If the individual is miserable, then we should be getting help for all kinds of reasons. Is the family miserable? Is their failing to launch impacting the family? Are the, is the mom and dad fighting? Are the sisters and brothers resentful? Are people coming in and saying, you need to do something about this? Then it is time to bring somebody in. Because what we know is that if this is a family and one person is struggling, they may even go off to treatment and do their treatment thing. If the other four people don't look at the way they're interacting and the way they are impacting the whole family dynamic, then that person comes right back in and the pattern ensues again. What exactly can a professional like you do to help? Well, number one, I think that an outside voice, a family therapist, a consultant, a even an executive coach, all of those sorts of professions who come in and say, with a neutral, clear eye, this is as good as it's going to get for the time being, and here is where you should be looking at going, is an important first step. Can you offer any kind of anonymous examples, good stories, if you will? Good stories, yes. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so, yes, yes, yes. Called in by a family who was concerned about failing to launch, and this person had a real 
pressured environment from their parents that they would engage in the family business. This person was no more capable of engaging in a family business for all kinds of reasons, but the family business kept modifying what was expected and then sort of shaming this young man for not measuring up. So we had some real conversations about what this young man's passion was with the young man. And he talked about all kinds of things that had nothing to do with what he was expected to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I encouraged him and facilitated conversations with his parents. And in that, his parents had that aha, all of the way they'd been trying to love their son was build this business, provide for him a road through adulthood that was going to be safe and secure and lucrative. That is what his parents wanted for him and loved him with that. Unfortunately, that wasn't how he was going to be able to receive love. He needed the freedom to go forge a path that was separate from that. And that's what he did. And he's happy. The family's happy. It's doing well. It's bumpy. It's bumpy. But it isn't um, toxic anymore. It's normal struggles. Oh, that's excellent. Congratulations. So for those who may be hesitant to get professional assistance, or maybe they just want to try something on their own first, what can a family do to stop a youth's bad behavior? Like, what would you tell a best friend? <laughs> Evaluate the way you dance in response, because what we never really have control over is in what you said, we never can stop somebody else's bad behavior, but we can change our steps to that dance. And the first step I would say is, do you have conversations about the behavior? Do you have calm conversations when it isn't actually going on? Do you initiate you know, conversations that have nothing to do with bad behavior or connecting in other ways? Because what we know is the magic recipe is connection and honesty or holding up the mirror, but there has to be the connection that is fostered first. How would a family, let's say, make a youth more accountable? And um, we always talk in family business how we enable, <laughs> well, okay. parents enable bad behavior. So yeah. how would we make them maybe um, some really tangible ways a family could maybe increase accountability and make sure they're not enabling bad behavior? So it depends on the age. If they're providing certain things that are being used in as a vehicle for abuse, let's say it's a teenager and they have a cell phone and they're using Snapchat to get drugs, take away the cell phone for a while. That is a legitimate response to somebody using that phone for something that's lethal potentially. So if we're talking about setting boundaries, boundaries need to show number one, the door in the door in, what behavior the family can support and what behavior the family won't support. And then you have to withstand the barrage. What do you mean you're going to take away my phone? You can't take away my phone. Yes, actually I can, or I may not take it away, but I will turn it off. So it sounds like we need backbones. <laughs> Well, I think if one of our things is we're really trying to create adults that we want to be around later, we've got to teach those lessons younger. Because if our jobs are twofold, one, to make sure that they know we love them just because they breathe, just for who they are, and two, make sure they can function without us. We got to set the stage early that life will have consequences and there are natural consequences to everything we do. Sometimes good ones, sometimes bad ones. It's not punishment. So if the consequence is actually logically tied to the behavior you're trying to change, it's easy. If you drink and drive, you can't have access to my car. If you drink and drive is clear, can't have access to my car. It's my car. I have control over that until I get a sense that you have stopped drinking. That shows the door in. How do you light a fire under them? So first of all, I think we have to evaluate again our role in that. How are we making life their private Idaho? 
You know, I did an, an intervention many years ago on a young man with a very serious substance use problem. And I went to the home and the dad didn't want to make wake him up. And I said, well, when was the last time you saw him? And the father responded, well, yesterday. And I said, well, doesn't he come to the kitchen? He said, no, he's got a little mini kitchen in his room and he's got his computer and he's got, a, you know, a huge TV. And, and I said, does he have a bathroom adjoining? He said, oh yeah, he's got his own suite of rooms. And I'm like, okay. And how does he pay for his substances? And the dad said, well, I give him a few hundred bucks a day. He says, weed is expensive. It wasn't weed. And what the dad was trying to do to keep him safe was actually, you know, backfiring. So that's the most extreme example of a parent making it easy for a kid. But we do it in all kinds of ways. I do it in all kinds of ways. And I know better. In closing, what is the best advice you have for raising responsible adults? First of all, have more confidence that they can do more of what we tell them to do and that we don't have to tell them the way to do it. The more advice we give them, the less they think for themselves. So in closing, if I were to give advice to parents, say less, say less and watch what they do more and expect them to do more. So thank you so much. Again, it was Diana Clark, who is Chief of Clinical Operations at O'Connor Professional Group. Thank you. Thank you.